And at the end of the day, we leave the best as last. Yes, that's the way. Welcome, Jarmo, uh, head coach of women's under-23 national team. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Yes, for me too. We haven't seen each other for many years. It's been a while. It's been a while. Yeah. Listen, uh, you were the member of the technical observer team of the UEFA Women's Euro Finals last that's summer. That's correct. And the technical report were released about one month ago. About one month ago, it was released in St. George's Park in, in England to all the national team coaches and technicians from uh, all the member countries of Europe. And you are now going to go through that report? Yep. I'm curious. Thank you so much. Please. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a great, ple great pleasure to be here with you on the Finland, Finland Football Development Day. And uh, I've been asked to deliver this presentation in English and uh, I tried to provide that. Uh, the topic is Women's Euro 2022. And uh, UEFA is producing technical reports of all the tournaments, uh, adult tournaments, youth tournaments, futsal tournaments, beach soccer tournaments. And uh, it was a pleasure to be part of the technical observer group uh, third time. The first time I did 2013 in Sweden, 2017, and this postponed tournament 2022. Here's our group. and. Uh, just a few words regarding to the development of the technical reports in general. Uh, the fact that we had such a distinguished and large group of specialists also highlights the investment of the technical work by UEFA and also the investment on the women's game in particular. So we had first time also huge support from statistical and data point of view. We had a football education unit represented by Adler Roslan and Thomas Cooper, who were providing us technical, tactical data. And we also had fitness data, which we haven't had before. FIFA has been in the forefront of, of uh, fitness studies. 2011, 15, 19 World Cups in women's game have produced an excellent reports. And this time we also had that available. So here's the, just a reminder to all of you that uh, all the UFA technical reports are available on the UFA website and uh, I'm happy to promote that because I'm trying to give you an overview of the technical report. I'm going to try to cover the main things that uh, we found our findings from the Women's Euro, but I know that also you want to dig deep and that technical report with all the video clips, all the statistics and players and coaches' voice, which is really, really important, that's available for you for the, in the UFO website. So record-breaking tournament, second time we had 16 teams in the final tournament, highest of standards, real benchmark, new champions, second time in a row, England won it first time, Netherlands won it first time in 2017, and trends technical, tactical, and also a lot of, lot of important and useful physical data and future very much is already here. So having a look at that as well. I'm going to try to cover from the technical report, first of all, the transition play, which was highlighted in many cases, talk a little bit about what is happening on the defending, in possession, how did the teams approach that, how did the players look into that, goal scoring, obviously, Goalkeeping, absolutely. Then a little bit of uh, feeding onto Krikke's excellent presentation regarding the Finland experience of the physical demands. And finally, do a little bit of game evolution. I've got a number of uh, clips available, but I'm just going to save that to the last. I'm very, very conscious about the time. So if we do, I'm going to give you a couple of examples of the material that we're going to go through. Highlighting again that all the material that is presented here is going to be available for our coach education and player develop development people. Marianne Mietinen, our women's football technical director, Hannu, our, our, our new head coach, Marco Salorant, and all the youth coaches. So when you want to dig in deeper, you've got pl plenty of opportunities. Kick off with the transitions. Uh, one of those things that was highlighted by the coaches already during the tournament was the importance of the transition game. Here's a quotation from Jane Ludlow, uh, former Welsh women's national team coach, and also at the moment uh, head of the Manchester City Women's Academy. 
and she mentioned that how important the transitions, tran the transition game in general, in particular mentioning Germany's ability to use those transitions, their ability to be effective from attacking perspective, but also very, very difficult team to court out with the defensive transitions. So again, few s statistics regarding the transitional setup. Uh, very important part of the transition tools was the ability for the counter pressure. After losing possession, in particular teams that went further in the tournament were very, very effective on average in every game of applying the counter pressure immediately after losing possession. And this is the statistics about the team's number of counter pressures on average. So this is also in relation to the games uh, that they've been playing. And you can see that Germany is one of the stood out teams in that perspective. However, there's also a number of other uh, teams who, whose ability to be effective after losing possession was very, very visible during the, during the tournament. Counter pressures preventing the opponent to counterattacks. So countering the counterattacks, what were the ingredients also to be able to do that? Good balance, right mindset, combination of individual ability and collective awareness. And preventing the counterattacks, but also being able to keep the momentum of the attack going, losing the possession temporarily, but being able to win it straight away back and continuing the attack again. Another statistics highlighting the numbers of individual teams after the counter pressure regains an ability then to continue the attack. Very, very useful and very, very interesting statistics. And even though the teams that went deeper in the tournament obviously are highlighted in these statistics, it's very much on the toolbox of every participating team. Having said that, it also had, it has impact on the, how the teams are set out to do that. Very much first line of defense is your forwards. Usually the nearest players, the ball after losing possession, but also the structure behind, uh, behind the first line of, line of defense, the, 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 the forwards, how the midfield is set out and also the defense line, are we ready to stay high and quick to reorganize to avoid the counterattack. That was very visible. Two examples here on the still pictures, Netherlands forwards ready to apply the immediate pressure and then Sweden in a similar situation, ball lost deep in the opponent's half, midfield staying high, moving to the ball side, three, three defenders line not dropping, staying high and being ready to win the ball immediately back. One of the key observations overall when we, when we think about the strate strategic defensive approach of the teams in the tournament. Moving on, in general, what were the major findings of the defensive setup? Again, looking a little bit further on down the line, how the, how the evolution of game has, has gone 2017, 2013, and even previous Women's Euro, Adler Rosland and his uh, team in the UEFA football education has done a really, really useful study about the, how the defensive game has evolved in the last 20 years. In 2017, looking at the defending, how the team set out to organize the, the out of possession phase. We named it case for defense because it was very much being a, effective in the block, whether it was a mid block, low block, deep block, or occasional defending on the opponent's half. So very interesting to see what, what, what's happening on the defending, defending in 2022. One of my first games, actually the first game was Germany against Denmark in London, and that really set the tone. You could see that the big change, change had, had uh, happened between 2017 and 2022. Here's the statistics uh, of the turnovers in 2017 in Netherlands. We can see that the, the heat map red, uh, in, in red is marked where the turnovers or the transition happened in general during the game. We can see that it was very much on the block, 
winning the ball happened usually on your own half and also on the wide areas. Whereas we see that 2022, the team set out to defend in the opponent's half. From block defending to defending forward, defending to attack, winning the ball as quick as possible. That was very much highlighted on the first game that I saw Germany against Denmark. Germany set the benchmark also in that respect. And it really is being equipped to defend high up the pitch. Block defending is still, still very much on the agenda. You have to be effective, you have to be ac active on that, but you also have to be able to defend deep. Germany had everything in their locker, as did so many other teams. Pressing matters, another useful statistic comparing teams' pressures in opposing half. With the statistics, there's also definition of what do we, what do we measure, what, what do we uh, consider to be a pressure. Uh, and of course, statistically, you can define it different ways, but it is an active uh, press on the player in possession within the certain distance. And again, in the same way that when the number of pressures on average for the teams has been measured, so is also the pressure regains on the opponent's half. And again, the same, same situation we, where you can see that the teams going deeper in the tournament were very, very clearly present in the higher number of pressures and also the pressure regains, but it's also on the agenda of every team. At the moment, the differences between the, when the teams going deeper is the ability to do it consistently throughout game in, game out, and also being able to win the ball back, win, win the ball back, win the ball high up the pitch early as possible. This is the picture that you saw very often during the women's Euro. Goal kicks have become a very important set pieces in many ways. Restarts, how do you set out when the landscape in front of you is that the opponent is trying to conquer your own half? Because that's the way teams set out to do it. This is a still picture from one of, one of the key games of the tournament, Spain against uh, Germany. And you can see that every player is ready when the ball is moving from the goal kick, ready to defend forward. Every player practically from Spain's team is on the opponent's half. And again, what's the job description for the different lines, for the different individual players when the first line of defense is very much the line that is doing the pressure? And then the structure, active, flexible, moving structure behind the first line of defense. And line that is comfortable to play one way, one line that is comfortable to staying high and being ready for the transition to win the ball. It is also very interesting, coming back a little bit to Krikke's presentation regarding the physical requirements. When you try to stay compact on the opponent's half, it also means that you need to cover a lot of ground. You've got to be able to cover a lot of ground to stay compact. You've got to be flexible. You've got to leave some players without direct control or marking, if you like, to be able to put effective pressure on the ball. And this is good picture from France applying the high pressure in the open play situation on the opponent's half. And you can see how compact the team is. But it means that if the opponent is able to play out, it means that you have to shift, you have to be able to cover extra mile, extra meters to, to be able to apply the pressure again. One part of Pressing one part of the defensive toolbox is still the block, active, advanced block, midfield block. This is Sweden against Switzerland in one of the probably the most uh, resembling the findings of the 2017. However, the key thing, the key difference between 2017 and 2022 is that whenever you were looking at teams in midfield or advanced block, they were ready to attack quickly. There are different classification of what do we ca uh, classify as, as a counter-attack or quick attacking. But definitely, even with the blocks, the readiness to transition from defense to attack, being compact when defending, denying the playing inside the shape 
and being ready to use the players in good advanced positions to make the transition and attack the spaces quickly. Finally, thinking on how that uh, attacking on the uh, defending on the opponent's half was also visible. This is a still picture from Germany applying it against Austria. Again, another important and key game in Finland's group and shifting first from left side to right side, right side to left side again and being able to keep control of the closest player, changing the player, swapping the player if you like and still keeping the high line. Again the same situation, ball has moved on to the, the other side and every player is connected, every player is ready to become the first defender to apply the pressure on the ball and timing and the quality of that action to win the ball is of the highest, of the highest quality. When we consider what has happened between the five, five years, you can clearly see that the main finding is that the teams are ready to defend higher up the pitch to conquer the opponent's half. From the restarts, from the goal kicks, the set out is very much that the teams want to win the ball back early and that requires ability, physical ability, technical, tactical matureness, flexibility, ability to read the game and also obviously high quality of scouting and planning to see how to use those moments as effectively as possible. Moving on in possession. Uh, if we consider that uh, there was a clear and quite uh, radical change between 2017 and 2022 with the, how the team set out to defend, of course that, th that sets uh, quite a lot of uh, requirements of the teams in possession. And one of those things that struck the technical observers and, and the technical team is that the player's technical ability individually is a very, very high, at very, very high level. There were a lot of individual players who highlighted that ability to work in the tight spaces. Coming back a little bit to the excellent uh, uh, presentation regarding futsal's uh, gains and, and, and possibilities from football's perspective. One of the things that, that struck uh, to the technical observer's eye was definitely the ability to work in tight spaces and to be able to play out from the tight spaces. Switch the game, switch the direction of the game, ability to work under pressure. This is one of those things which mean, means that then in possession teams were able to apply different styles. Uh, we've chosen a couple of examples again from the teams that, uh, that uh, went, went further in the tournament. But basically we are talking about every 16 teams having ability to keep possession, possession with a purpose, possession with also with the productivity. And in this case dividing it in two phases, possession in general, the different approaches and then progression into the final third. How did the teams broke the enemy, enemy units, enemy lines, advanced, went into the opponent's half. So first, in general, there's England, uh, Germany, Sweden, uh, Spain, obviously, having a little bit of examples, how, the, how did the teams approach that? There's a lot of uh, ability to be patient, keeping the ball when it's not possible or feasible or sensible to advance, being patient and waiting for the right moment to progress. England being very good at positional rotations, Germany being very good at finding areas around the opponent's shape, not trying to force to play inside the shape, but thinking forward, playing forward and finding the ways to go forward. Sweden with a good flexibility also with the structures using the wing backs very effectively in possession and keep it, keeping the white players in the inside pocket and having a very quick ball progression from the back to the front and being able to play through the units quickly. And then Spain with the very, very familiar 4-3-3 and being able to use that positional structure using the attacking fullbacks, switches of the play and being very, very comfortable in possession in general. 
Like said that uh, it might be obvious conclusion that teams reaching semi-final all had over 50% of possession. But again, variations, how nations were using it, it goes all through the 16 teams. And the teams going deep had more flexibility, more different approaches to use possession, different variations from plan A to plan B to be able to use the possession productively. Secondly, another uh, interesting aspect of the possession is the progression. How did teams advance with the possession to the opponent's half all the way to the final third? And again, in the same way, there are different approaches. Iceland, talking about the small nations, they didn't lose a game in the women's Euro. They were one of those who had one, the, the fastest ball progression from, from back to front, being direct, being also physically very, very able to, to have that direct approach. Whereas then England's and Netherlands uh, ability to uh, control the rhythm of the game, take the tempo a bit down, use those rotations to be able to find ways forward. And this is again the similar structure regarding the how did the teams progress to the opponent's half. And here we have replaced Sweden with France with their, with their dynamics. Everybody was impressed with the France in the first game when they completely annihilated Italy in the first half 5-0 using the switches of play with the double wing attacking fullbacks looking like the France at their best and bringing that uh, directness and penetration into the, to the progression and the po possession. Whereas then Germany, England and Spain looked as they had looked in possession in, in general. England with the flexible wide triangles and triangles in general. Germany using the wide areas, using the fullbacks and wide players very effectively. As well as the focal point of the excellent centre forward pop and Spain being patient wearing the opponents down, progressing centrally when possible, but using the width when it was sensible. So from progression's perspective, again, the teams that progressed further had the most means of progression. They had the most means of uh, using the possession with purpose, being able to penetrate into the opponent's halves, being able also to wear the opponents down and being very, very fast when it was possible. Okay, Arma, one question from our audience. Uh, Yogo, is a, I think this is a really, really nice, nice point. That's, that's a good question. There's a myth that pressing high requires more running from the whole team. And he's asking, um, is there any data available for high pressing versus middle block or, or low pressing in opponent goal kicks, measuring the total distance running high speed runs or sprints for the entire team? This is actually an excellent question because uh, uh, in this physical data that we have available from the Women's Euro, unfortunately, there is not that context in which phase of the game it's actually applied. However, there's an excellent study that UEFA did from Women's Champions League mm. seasons 19, 20, 20, 21, where actually there is also context in, in which game phase it was happening. However, there is really good data if we consider, for instance, Germany, uh, who were clearly setting the benchmarks on the high pressing where when it comes to the dead ball situation, goal kicks or open play situations or counter presses, they were setting the, the benchmark. They had clearly higher number of high intensity runs than anybody else. Okay. We can we can build a connection from there that there is that element of, of if you press high, mm. Mm. it means that you've got to run more and you have to run more in the high speed categories. Yeah. But, okay, as an ex-player, if I think that a defending team sets the team up so that all the players are at, at, at the half of the, the team of, with the ball and if 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 the team with the ball is able to resist that pressing longer, that would, in my mind, meaning more, more meters run. You make perfect sense. So, yeah. like I said, that that's why we need the data also from the different game phases. Yeah. However, it indicates, and also, if we have time, I could probably show one of the examples of the transitions that Germany needed to make, first of losing possession and then winning it back 
deeper in the ocean. And that gives an indication how important yeah. that is from the defensive. Point. But it's a very feasible question because it requires that data. As you said, as a former, former top player, yeah. uh, if you defend effectively high up the pitch, mm. it doesn't necessarily yeah. mean that you have to cover a lot of ground. However, if the team is able to switch, if the team is able to progress, it means that you need to be ready to cover. Yeah, ground. and I would still add that, that that it might also only mean that those two, three players around the ball are working a lot, but the rest of the team is enjoying and, and resting, in a way resting, because those few players are doing a really, really good job. Then we come back to the fact that I mentioned that it was also very feasible, uh, very visible that teams and players are ready to work on tight spaces. They were able to play up, mm. which means that it's not only the first line of defence, but the structure behind the defence is as important and they needed to work as hard as anyone else. If somebody turns, switches the game, we are not enjoying it anymore. We're working our socks off. What, what, what a complicated sport we have here. We oh, have, there's always somebody has a new answer. This, this is a really, really good point because it simply raises the bar and the requirements of every player and highlighting it starting from the first line, second line and consider the fact that uh, when the press opens, and there's a deep pass behind the last line of defense, yeah, yeah. then we're in a hurry. Yeah, I, I would put this together in a way that we don't, a good team doesn't have to invent football again, but you always have to have a new answer because you always face uh, new and new problems. That's an excellent way to put it because the game is asking questions from us yeah. and we need to be able to provide the answers. Okay. I'm looking forward to you. You're going to talk about goal scoring. Let's, so. let's proceed. So, one of those things we've uh, highlighted, highlighted the quality of the players, technical ability, tactical maturity, excellent, active, defensive organizers, defending forward, defending an opponent. Has. So how is it possible that actually the number of goals was increasing? It was increasing quite drastically. And then there's uh, indications where did the goals initiated from and of course the quality of the actual finishing and then this uh, always interesting uh, dividends of how many open play goals, how many set plays, what sort of findings were there. Definitely one key finding is that the number of goals increased. So attacking was clearly more effective than 2017. Going back a little bit in 2017, there was a, like an overall feeling that defending was effective in block and the attacking players didn't really find the answers. Whereas we are on average almost one goal more in 2022. And like said that then it, it clearly highlights the player's ability and team's ability to find the, the, the answers from the defensive questions that were asked, asked from them and, and, and able to use the technical ability individually, collectively, open play, set play situation to find a way forward. From open play, clearly one of the key findings is that uh, the decisive pass comes very much from the wide areas. There's a little bit of comparisons with, with the other tournaments, but definitely the crosses initiated, whether we talk about uh, traditional cross from the byline or we talk about the diagonal pass or cutbacks, it's 43% of the open play goals compared to 33 in 2017. So if the defences were active on the opponent's half, very good in blocks and also capable of defending the box and the deep areas, you've got to find a way forward. And it seems that uh, those key passes, the final passes coming from the wide areas were one of the answers. There's a statistic regarding to that and like I said that the stati statistics is available and it's not a surprise then that uh, also when the deliveries come from, from the wide areas it means that some of those deliveries come in the air whereas headers contributed also a clear, clearly bigger number of the goals than earlier and if we look at the heading techniques, finishing techniques, they definitely stood out. There were some players with the excellent heading techniques combined to the really, really high quality final pass. Shots, uh, it's really interesting to see that 
if in 2017 the number of the long range shots was higher, then even though the number dropped, the quality definitely was higher. Knowing also that goalkeeping has improved clearly during the years, it also meant that if you try to hit, hit the target outside the box, the quality of the shot needs to be of the highest quality to beat the goalkeepers from the distance. Set play, importance of the corners, probably in a little bit of uh, accordance to the fact that uh, the deliveries from the wide areas in the open play, but also the importance of the corners was clearly uh, uh, in increased from the 2017. We talk about the 4% uh, overall change. One observation that was, uh, that was made by the technical observers is that in some cases you have to say that defensive organization didn't help to prevent the corners in every case. However, that is simplifying clearly the answer. Deliveries, heading techniques, different type of approaches, including even the fact that during the game there's an assistant coach uh, on, on the stands being in touch with the bench, probably giving indications how the opponent is organized during the set play and making it possible to use that to, uh, to an effect. Goalkeeping analysis, not going into too deep on, on, on that, but there was a real investment on the people working, working on the goalkeeping analysis. Annoy, the former Belgian national, women's national team head coach and goalkeeper coach, as well as the national goalkeeper, has been there for a number of years uh, doing the goalkeeping analysis and doing a fantastic job. Now she had a group of coaches, goalkeeper instructors helping and there's a real in-depth uh, material available from the, from the goalkeeping analysis as well. Just simply defining, divi uh, dividing it in, in four phases, defending the goal, defending the box, defending the space and goalkeeper's role in, uh, in possession as, as well. So overall, the observation was that there was a change to 2017. Change for the better, clear improvement basically at every aspect of goalkeeping. Not only the athletic development which felt that, uh, which everybody felt that that athletic foundation had, was clearly better, making the goalkeepers better equipped to be able to to answer the challenges of the, of the modern goalkeeping. Defending the goal, you can, you can look at it from the different perspective, but it's still the goal prevention that uh, uh, separates the best from the, from the rest. Overall, there are different statistics available without going into the, into the uh, too deep about the, the statistics, simply highlighting the fact that uh, the goal-saving techniques combined to the improved athletic abilities were really shown. And as I've already mentioned, that there were long-distance shots, but they were of the highest quality to beat the goalkeepers from distance. Added to that, there were some excellent close-range saves, reaction saves from the goalkeepers throughout and highlighting the ability to, for the goal prevention that was, that was uh, visible during the tournament. Important part of uh, defending the box, defending the, the goal, is, is also supporting the, supporting the defense line. And here's a little bit of statistics and graphics of the goalkeeper's uh, distance from the byline in, 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 in games, meaning that how far from the goal, goalkeepers were actually comfortable to, to stay. And there, there's some really interesting profiles regarding to the goalkeeper's ability. I'm just going to pick one, which I was quite impressed, even though, though the goalkeeper had a difficult semi-final. Hedvig Lindahl, who stood out with her, with, with, with her covering the, the Swedish defence line, in particular when Sweden was pressing high and staying on the opponent half, playing with the three centre-back line. There's a, there's a lot, of, uh, lot of good material on that perspective as, as well. Whereas also looking at our own goalkeepers and different profiles, interesting probably is that uh, the, the 
one of the best goalkeepers of the tournament, England goalkeeper, probably was the, one of the most traditional, staying quite deep. However, it is always a combination of how does your line work, what is feasible, what is sensible, what is the most use, useful distance from the defence line. Goal kicks and goalkeepers' participation in the opening phase. Uh, we already had a look at the, some of the still pictures. How does that picture look from the goalkeeper's perspective uh, when the opponent is set out to attack your own box immediately after the first line of defending? And like said, that uh, the very much on the agenda was open the game up from the back with a short first pass, whether it was delivered by goalkeeper or the defender to the goalkeeper. The important thing was what happens next. And it definitely set out the importance of that phase. And as, as mentioned, almost it's like a set play nowadays. How do you find a solution to bypass the high pressing? Moving on to the Physical analysis, uh, which I really enjoyed, Krikke's uh, analysis on the on the, the Finland and, and Finland's uh, uh, physical performance during the during the tournament. Finland's performance, whether we're talking about physically or some of the other technical tactical uh, statistics, was quite quite respectable. However, there are also indications that Finland, like quite a few other other teams, were basically separated from the, from the best performed teams, in particular in the highest intensity runs. Krikke already mentioned that, that, that zone five is just a reminder of the current zones because there's been a, a variations of the speed categories used, but now it seems to, be, seems to be settled both with FIFA and with UEFA studies that these are the speed, speed categories we are using. Big positive first time we have the physical data available in Women's Euro, which gives us in every member country good uh, benchmarks and it simply highlights the game intensity, the increased requirements and also there's position specific uh, uh, data available. Uh, when we look at the overall distance covered, and again bearing in mind that there's, uh, there's uh, in this study in some cases there was not a uh, uh, differentiation regarding the group phase and, and then the knockout phase. The differences, the variability between the teams in the overall team distance covered is not big. But then the difference comes in particular with the speed zone fine. There we can see team-wise clear difference between the teams, teams, team's ability to work with the highest speed, whether we're talking about uh, movements and actions without the ball or with the ball in possession phase, out of possession phase, different areas of the pitch. But definitely that was the differentiating factor, ability to work at the highest speed. And this obviously goes in line with the, with the observations that, uh, that's been made from, from the technical, tactical performance of the teams, whether we're talking about the transition in possession or out of possession game. So there is the basically the data regarding to that. And then, of course, one interesting detail here is that we talk about the importance of the speed, maximum speed and speed in general of the wide, uh, wide areas, players in the wide positions. However, you can see that when we talk about the, we, when, we, when we look into the data of the highest speeds that players reach during the, during the games, then we actually see that there's not too big difference between any playing position forwards in this case, the Iceland uh, excellent forward with a 31.44 kilometers per hour compared then to the, for instance, Germany center back with 30.03. You can see that uh, speed is very much required at every level. Then just a reminder then with the position specific average distances when we're looking at the benchmark in our own player development work, whether we're talking about the, our, our league clubs, our youth, youth teams. This is the direction where it goes. Uh, overall speed, speed endurance. Then, of course, one thing that 
personally and everybody else in the group was that we are missing the goalkeepers from this data. Goalkeepers are very important uh, to, to include, in particular when we think the requirements of the goalkeepers in the modern game. They need to play out quite a bit, they need to be good with the game opening phase, need to be able to cover actually quite a bit of ground as well as we mentioned. Final part, where the game is going. Already mentioning that future is very, very much seems to be here. And how do we take that into our player development uh, work? How do we practice these things? How do we turn this into a, in, into a training environment? Uh, last week I was in Lithuania in a similar workshop where we had a couple of days with the coaches. And, uh, and one part of that was that they actually prepared training sessions with the and run the training session with the findings. How do we work on that? Because the game is certainly evolving. This is from the long-term study, the historical trend, uh, which, we, which we already noted that there's a change. This is from the 97 until 22. Where did the turnovers, where did the transitions happen? And you can see that in basically the last 20 years, we've been on that transition, tra tradition where, where we can say that our zonal defending, our set way to defend in certain areas has dictated quite a bit what has happened. And then the game evolution between 2017 to 2022 is quite, quite radical. You quite seldom see that there's a data supporting what your observations uh, tell you. And you can see that now, if in a more traditional approach, the midfield or your own half was the area where the pressures and the turnovers and transition happened, now it can be in your opponent's box. So what does that tell then from the, if we turn the, the coin around that, uh, what does that require from the players in the future? If the press is high, it means that then everybody at the back need to be able to deal with it. Our centre backs, our full backs, a couple of years ago we, 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 we discussed that the full backs are the new playmakers. Centre backs and goalkeepers seem to be in that. We need to work under pressure, we need to be a lot on the ball, we need to be able to bypass the defences. Centre midfield players, in the same way, those players are forced to play even more congested areas. Less space, less time, less possibilities. And yet they are still the key players when you open the game and you get past the pressures. So this is the picture. Future is here. Tactical conclusions. Less time, less space, more intensity, more athletic requirements, more data and more tools for us to analyze the game and take it into our daily environment. Okay. What a great presentation. Thank you, Jarmo. Pleasure. I, I really like the numbers where you showed um, how setting the high pressure, how it, it has evolved, and more teams are really pressing higher, higher on pitch. I think it's one of those things that, um, like I said, that this is the first time we actually had the full scale of the analysts available. In uh, 2017, we were still relying on. We, we got bits and pieces mm -hmm. from some of the some mm -hmm. of the some of the countries. We also had a possibility to interview the coaches, and you get a little bit of information that. But now we've got the we've got the full capacity of the UEFA technical support, which has helped us to provide better technical report than ever. Okay, I have one question from from Jarko. And he's saying, ask a great job. Thank you, pleasure. Uh, he's asking, uh, in your opinion, what are the trends that we, I think Finland, need to follow to keep up with the bigger countries? Well, the thing, thing is that uh, we, we have a meeting uh, again next week with the, with the women's and girls national team coaches and technicians to think and dig deep into the findings that we have here. If I look at that, if I look at uh, there's a lot of clips which are also available. We, we need to be able to deal with the press, mm. which, which means that our technical ability needs to be better. Turning it around, I know that this is one of those things that uh, Marco and the women's national team uh, is, is looking. We need to be able also to apply 
effective press mm. in every part of the pitch. And that sets us quite, uh, quite, quite big demands of, of every playing position. But like I said, that uh, uh, technical ability makes you able to deal with the press. Yeah. And then, of course, technical, tactical game understanding and athletic foundation gives you possibility to apply it. And I also think it, it's another story to have this big amount of data, which we say is useful, but it's another story to really put that data in use in, in Finnish football. I think that is really, really valid point again and very, very important point because that uh, it, it, the situation hasn't changed from the coaching and education perspective. We need to yeah. pick out the crucial things that we will then deliver to our players, to, de to deliver our coaches to our club so that we can help our players and Finnish football too. One last question, personal question. There's no point comparing women's football and men's football, but I'm, I'm talking about the game itself, uh, how it's played. Who is setting the trends here? Men's football or women's football? There's always a connection. Mm. There, there used to be the situation probably that the, the, the transfer from the men's game took a little bit longer time. But you could, you could argue that there's almost a real-time change. If, if we look, look at the, the things that we've been looking into today, whether we're talking about the learnings from futsal or other, other areas, it's very much almost in real time. And like I said, that the com comparisons are useful from that perspective, that it's the same game. Mm. Okay. Thank you, Jarmo. It was a pleasure. Have Thank a you. Have nice Christmas time.